okay so as i was saying uh, this week's content uh, unexpectedly was too vast so we have uh, a lot of uh, coding and that to uh, immediately we are jumping into coding and then doing a lot of uh, special interpolation map and fitting model and all that so what i have decided is uh, in this session we will cover uh, the topics which will allow us to be able to solve this confidence builder so i will uh, i have already written the code in r i will share the same with you guys also uh, and uh, so i will explain how uh, we are going to do this step by step and uh, we'll call that uh, we'll call it a day for this session because i don't want to clutter uh, the model test validation also into the same thing so we'll first uh, go through some of the basics of data handling of uh, the data frame saving the data in r and then we'll go with uh, poly with step by step into each of these uh, questions yeah and uh, in the next session probably we will try to cover the models because uh, i think the, the the model model validation also will be in the last session so we'll kind of club them together so if you have not taken the screenshot of this uh, word document because i don't think the word document or the codes were shared with you so you can take a screenshot of this and uh, or what you can do is you can go and take the screenshot from the nptl video also and we'll start with the session okay good so i have divided the session so uh, you can tell me if the fonts are too small to see then i can increase the size or is it fine so we have only fine okay okay good thanks so yeah so we'll start with not the basics of r as i said basics of r were uh, covered nicely by sir so we'll not go into that we'll start with uh, loading the data uh, data for our uh, analysis and we'll do the analysis ourselves okay so to load the data for this week and the next week Sir said that we'll be using uh, Ether library. Ether library. So to download that, if you have not paid attention to the session, first we need to install the package Dev Tools. Then we need to load that, and we need to get the Ether package uh, using the Dev Tools. So I have already done that. So that's why I have commented these uh, lines. So this is basically coming from a GitHub repository, as Sir said. So we will just re run this line, and we will load our uh, Ethereum. And then we so this uh, this particular uh, library has a lot of data points. So you would have seen that we have uh, US uh, USYD soil, then uh, HV hundred and HV dem. So we will use. Uh, for now, we will just load the uh, USYD soil one data, and we'll see how how it looks like. So it is a data frame with sixteen columns and hundred rows. And uh, so basically, you so one thing I noticed was in the sessions, sir used to keep on the left side a lot of structured data, right? So that is not necessary. See, this can be a little bit intimidating that we have soil dot data. If I uh, if I like, I can also just do the this uh, data is equal to USD, and I can have the data same thing. But to maintain some kind of consistency, I will also use uh, the same thing that uh, Sir has used, even though it is not very pleasing and a little bit confusing also. But still, we'll use the soil dot data. And uh, just to uh, clarify to you guys that when whenever on the left hand side we will have some kind of dotted structure, most of the time we don't need that dot, and we can give it uh, one normal variable name. 
but uh, i think to maintain some kind of homogeneity we will do that dot for now now you can get the dimension of the data as i said oh so it is 166 columns and uh, rows and 16 columns so there are 16 features here these are all features if you remember we discussed and now we can get the structure what does the structure tell us structure will tell us each of these columns what kind of data do they have so uh, profile has integer land uh, land class has some factors probably these are uh, let's see what they are so these are uh, uh, some strings so for now it is taking it as a factor and uh, then we have uh, numbers for uh, upper and lower depth and integers some of the integers are there so it is able to recognize that and for float it is just giving numbers float means the decimal uh, numbers okay and now if we want to access the first five elements of these two columns uh, the column being total uh, carbon and CEC we can use the combine so for the rows we will give 1 is to 5 for the columns we will give combine the total carbon column and CEC, car, uh, CEC column so if we do that we can get the first five so just remember that uh, when you are accessing a data frame you use this uh, anything I think in the vectors also when you are accessing some variable in which uh, some values are stored if it is a two dimensional uh, or three dimensional uh, if it is a two dimensional then you use a uh, square bracket with uh, first uh, first entry being the row second entry being the column if it is just an array then you can just uh, put one entry inside that and get the value okay so this is how we can get this now we can also make a subset of our soil data where this eps is also one of the columns so if you go here esp this is also one of the columns so we can create a subset of the soil data which satisfies these two conditions where that is ESP is greater than 10 and lower depth is greater than 0.3 so if we run this we have this subset if, and now if you want to assign this to some other uh, variable name you can do that also and if you go here then we will see that ESP is so which one I have opened you are supposed to get ESP greater than 10 and lower depth greater than 0.3 probably this is okay 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 sorry i created it here so now if we go to soil one you'll see that esp greater than 10 is selected and the other condition being lower depth greater than 0.5 greater than 0.3 sorry so this is how you can do that and uh, one more way is See, most of many of the times uh, there are shortcuts in Excel also. What we would want is uh, let's say you have some columns. Now I want to uh, arrange uh, all these entries in such a way that my send is in ascending order. So here also this kind of shortcut is there, but you can do the same using the uh, code also. So what you do is you order the soil um, uh, soil with the data so the soil clay so when you do this order you will get the indices so if i just run it with uh, select and control enter you'll see you will get the indices of it from increasing order and what we have done here if you look carefully what we have done is we have just accessed the soil data tape data frame and put these indices in the row in place and when we do comma and nothing it is automatic go, automatically going to decide that it has to take all the columns so this is nothing fancy when you say empty it is going to decide all the columns so what we are doing we are getting the soil data for all the indices which are arranged in such a way that the clay uh, clay column is in ascending order so now what we can do we can put it in soil 2 and we can see uh, if that's what is happening so we can open soil 2 and we can see the clay 5 8 and 9 so it is in increasing order and uh, do we get the same thing if we do this uh, this thing here so if you see uh, the 
data frame shortcut that was clicking the button on this clay, uh, the clay column of the data frame was also giving us 116. And we, using our code also, we got this 116. Okay, so that's that. Some of the things we, uh, we would have removed, that's why not all the entries will be the same. Okay, and also you can remove the NA, sorry, you can remove the NAN values from the soil data. To do that, you can get uh, using which, which is basically giving you the index of whatever the condition is inside, condition is in, put inside this uh, particular normal bracket. So for now, the condition is, is NAN in the matrix or the data frame soil data. So it is going to give us the index wherever the values are NAN. Also, we can, if instead of soil data, I can just uh, say in the soil data, I want to know where the clay is NAN. So if I do that, so we can see that clay is NAN at 5, 10, 15. So if we just go and see, oh, so I have done that, yeah. No, I want it in normal order. For some reason it is not in normal order. Let's do this again then. Yeah, so if we do that, soil data should be, probably I have modified it and that's why it is creating some kind of issue. So let's do this again. And soil data. Okay, yeah, so if you see the fifth one is NAN. 10th one is NAN, so we can easily get. So this is one of the problems I think I encountered with uh, R that it, uh, if you do some uh, funny thing changes here and there, then you have to refresh the code. Probably I am not very familiar with R, that's why I am saying this. But if you also feel that something is not working as a, as you expected, just rerun the code and it will reset all the data frames and it will work out fine. Okay, so this is just the basic handling that I thought we should discuss about the data frames. Now let's go get into the plotting and the funny things or no, the interesting things of the session. So first is we'll uh, handle the vector data. So uh, yesterday we discussed which things uh, come inside the vector data. Can you... Uh, write them can you name them out so which uh, which features in a map are represented using the vector data so if you remember in the gis when we talked about geographical information system we had two type of data that is raster data and vector data raster data was gridded data and whereas vector data contained points line and area Right, so when we say vector data and let's load this data, you will see that we have points here. So we have loaded HV100. So let's go to HV100. So you see we have loaded X, Y, that is points and organic content, electrical conductivity, and pH of the soil wherever we have done that. The soil ID is on the first column, but we are not interested in that for now. So you can also check the structure now. As uh, was discussed, as for now, if you check the structure, you see that uh, R does not know that this X and Y are actually X and Y, means they are the spatial coordinate. It is just taking them as numbers. So we need to tell R using this library, that is a spatial coordinates library, we need to tell R that in this HV100, the X and Y are actually locational indicators. So we get the package, uh, load the package SP. And when we do that, now if you see the structure of HV, probably it, was, it should show us that OC is or any content is number, electrical conductivity is number, pH is number, but our X and Y, they have become coordinate system. See? Okay. Okay, so let's move on now. So we have done that now. 
we have made them into coordinate system and we have checked the structure again also. Now let us plot them and we are plotting them based on the organic content. So we have uh, plotted based on the organic content and we have uh, put some kind of cutoff so that, uh, okay, so that uh, let me access, I want to see H, uh, so I will write in command from, I want to see the organic content now. So if I do this, will I be able to see? Uh, probably, yeah, so if we can do that using A is equal to this, let's see if I'm able to, yeah. Now if I click on A, so it is not showing to me. So basically what we have done here is we have put some kind of threshold uh, and we have plotted the organic content into five categories. See, so we have plotted organic content into five different categories. So that we can explore. I am not sure, not pretty sure why uh, it, this was done. Maybe we just want to make some bands. That's why we have done. So let's see if we make it as two, then what happens? Yeah, so this cuts uh, is responsible for uh, dividing or cutting this data into five or uh, two. So you can play with that. Okay, now see we want to see this thing in in a map if we want to see this uh, these points that we have in our uh, hv100 in a map we need to give it a projection system for now the x and y they were just uh, in meters so we need to uh, give them in some kind of projection system so that r can convert them into lat long format and plot it on a map so we use this so for now, this uh, projection system EPSG 32758 was chosen Curve. and we have done, we have initialized our projection string and we have done the projection. Now, if we want to save this uh, file, so as you know, uh, we discussed last time or probably I, I don't, I don't know whether we discussed it or not, this uh, vector uh, data is always stored in the shape file. So we need to write a shape file and put it into the, uh, put this HV100 inside that. And to do that, we need to, in these two libraries, that is uh, raster, library raster and library uh, rgdal. Also, uh, when I didn't use these two libraries, I was getting some error while saving. So let's see. So I loaded them and then I uh, was not getting this error. So we'll see whether if we get uh, error this time also, then in that case, we'll load them again. So yeah. So for now, I'm just getting some warning message, not the error. But if you get the error, that is the library SF and Terra is missing. We just load them and then comment them. And in that will be fine. So for now, we have written our HV100 shape file in in the shape file format and the name is hv underscore data underscore shape. So if you change the name here, the, the name with which it is saved will be changed. So now we can go to our working folder. So one more thing that you will, you may face, uh, problem you may face is that you will not be able to see where is the working folder exit. So in that case, you just go to this uh, open button and most likely it will open in the uh, in your working folder or if it is not then you just go and check if you have just done the uh, like a uh, normal installation without giving any custom uh, directories then it will be probably in your document file so that's what happened with me also so as you can see here we have uh, saved our hv underscore data underscore shape file in this particular folder and that will be used uh, in the GIS, QGIS, RGIS if you are uh, using them. I don't have Google Earth, but still I will uh, show you that uh, to do, to save this into the Google Earth, you can, uh, you have to convert it into KML format or KMZ format is also there. So uh, we can do this conversion using the SP transform, which comes from this uh, 
transformation uh, library and also the raster and we can do that and i'll just show you that uh, we have a uh, a file name hv100.kml which can be opened in google earth so i we have just saved now it will give some warning as long as uh, it is not giving us an error we will not bother about it because we don't we don't know how these basic packages are working for now so this is the hv100 kml that will be your uh, google earth file so if you have google earth if you just double click on it as sir showed it will be you can easily see the points on the google earth now you see here that uh, this hv100 where is that yeah so we have we have saved the uh, shape file to save it what we did we converted it from our normal database format to special point data frame <clears throat> right so when we load an uh, when we load a file also from us the shape file so let's we save this file so let's load the same file when we load this file it will be again in so we have just given the name import hv dot data again i will say that if you just uh, want to keep your life simple you can give different name and it will not cause any problem yeah it will not cause any problem you have this you have in the spatial format so now to do some analysis we can convert it into the normal format that is uh, where is that projection for string so when uh, let me see what happened when we loaded this so when we loaded this data it is in form uh, formal class of spatial point data frame but when we did this and uh, let's say we gave it a name like this then we have in a crs format okay so we have in a uh coordinate representation system format i don't i don't know where we'll use that but the thing is uh, you, we can uh, load the shape file and we can save the shape file using the write org and read uh, write ogr and read ogr format okay now that is done with the shape file probably you uh, will use the shape file in the qgis so i did a course where we did that so this will be helpful if we have a uh, data a uh, lot of data points and we want to convert it into shape file we can do that or we can do that in uh, qgis itself there is a feature in qgis and rgis that can do that also so now let's come to the raster data so these uh, these things actually are not useful for uh, the confidence builder but i just want to go through them as was uh, as sir went through these things so that just we are covering most of the things that was discussed okay now when we loaded this hv uh, 100 if you just load it again it was in a, a x y and oc right so x is different y is different but now let's let's load the raster data and remember i said the raster data is in a grid format so if we load this sorry if we load this and if you see hvdem so here also you are seeing x y and elevation so the dem that is the digital elevation map but if you look carefully you can easily identify that this is in a grid format because you see uh, y is constant and x is increasing at an interval of uh, yeah y is constant and x is increasing so Uh, y is constant two times here. X is increasing. Then y is again constant, and x is increasing. So if you plot them in a scatter plot, you will see that they are in a grid format. So let me try that. If we can do it, I don't know whether it will be 
uh, we can do this or not, but let us see. X comma Y. So if you see here, I am not able to, I have not plotted it nicely. See that uh, this is a grid where X and Y are um, varying. So using this PCH, we can get some kind of small dots and uh, it will be nicely visible, but I am not able to get it right now. So let's try a higher value. It seems to be decreasing with higher value. Yeah, but you get the point. Yeah, you see now we, okay, we need to delete this. Delete this block. Okay, so still it is not coming, but you get the point that it is in a grid format. Whereas previously these things were in a, if I just do SV100, HV100, so there is no underscore here. Okay, okay, they are in a small, they are small X and Y is also one of the issues yeah so these are in a point so now uh, we have seen that we have our hp uh, underscore dem in kind of a grid format okay now when we want to see this in a nice uh, dem format we need to convert this from this kind of a data frame kind of structure to a dem. So we use a raster from XYZ into that and we convert into R dot dem. And we give it a coordinate system so that we will be able to project it. So now if we do the plot, you will see a nice plot of the DEM. And now if we want to plot the points that uh, were uh, loaded in the uh, shape file then we can do that also on top of it okay it probably work now yeah so we need to, uh, since I loaded it again, so uh, we need to tell the R again that the X and Y are actually the coordinates. All right. Now we can write this raster also in ASCII format and we can save it in HV underscore dem 100 dot ASC. So using the right raster, we will run that and we have this. Then we have, we can uh, project it and if you want to see it in the Google Earth form as same as the shape file, we can see the dem also in the Google Earth form. So we first pro make the projection of this raster and we can save it into the KML form or KMZ form. And that's, uh, that's done. We can go ahead in our working directory and we can see that we will have hv underscore dem dot KMZ that uh, can be used in the Google Earth. Now, the same way we can read also that we have saved this raster using the right raster. We can read also using the read GDAL. And if you see, we have uh, saved the data in read GDAL. Yeah, so it is a formal class spatial grid data frame. So when you read it, Again, it is in the some kind of data frame format. So we need to convert it into the raster format and we can do that using the command raster and grid DEM. Now it is in the form of raster layer. 
Okay, and then again we can plot this. So if you just want to plot, you can check. So we can do that. So you can see we have plotted the raster again. So this is what uh, some some of the data handling of the raster and the this is what was discussed about some of the data handling with the raster and the shape file. Now let's move on to the so this uh, briefly I wanted to go over this. Now let's move on to the confidence builder so that we can have some confidence in our R. So we'll first we'll do uh, these things. Uh, so uh, using the one profile and uh, if you remember, so as uh, it was discussed in the class that uh, when we have when we perform some tests in different locations, the tests are not performed in the same depth as sir discussed. So some will perform in from 0.5 in, in the top 5 centimeter of the soil. Some will perform on the 15 to 30, others 30 to 60 and it can go up to 100 or 200 centimeters also. So to get the uh, kind of smooth fitting on top of the pointed or the scattered plot we will uh, here we are asked to fit a line that is a special line so we are going to do that so let's load the data before all we have to load this it i think so i have already uh, discussed that how you can get this uh, package package i think so we'll just load it now and then we can load the one profile data so let's load and see what is there in the one profile data Oh, sorry. Yeah. So let's go to the one profile data and you see that we have the soil ID and the carbon kg per meter cube and we have done the sampling in the layer that is from 0 to 10 centimeter, 20 to 10 to 20, 30 to 40. So we have uh, this reading in this kind of a band. So now what is asked of us? is using the equal area spline with one profile data uh, up to 100 centimeters. So with lambda of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.5 and 0 0.8. So we'll do some of these lambdas. So basically we have loaded and we can also check the structure. So this upper bound and lower bound are, are in and the carbon values are in the uh, float. So they are using, they are shown using the numerical format. And then we can just do the fitting. So there is no need to load any package for this ES line. It is already loaded. So when we do this, we can run this whole line. So for now, we have just a lambda of 0.1. And since it is asked of us to uh, do till 100, uh, till 100 centimeter interpolation. So we have just restricted our D till 100. So let's run this. I did the show progress true. That's why we are seeing this bar. We can do the false and we can uh, get away with it. Now let's plot this. So we have plotted till 100. If you can see, we have done the interpolation till 100 and we have plotted. So basically, these three plots are, uh, we should get only one plot. This, this is the imp uh, important plot. The first one is... Is the yeah, so the first one is the important plot. The second plot are just showing the equal area concept that is being used for this equal area spline interpolation. So we don't need to get into that. So this is the important one. Now let's see what happens if we change the lambda to 0.2. Okay, now let's plot this. So uh, the smoothness has increased. So we can uh, you can explore with this. I just we'll just keep the lambda here as a lambda. And uh, when you are using this file, you can just change the lambda lambda here and, and 
use the code okay so the code works yeah so this is the kind of second part you can do that you can end uh, as discuss that uh, exporting files you can do from here so we'll not go into that much detail now the third question that is we use this uh, edge roy covariate data and do the stacking and uh, save it in some kind of a csv file so that's another simple thing we can do first if you are doing it separately you have to uh, load this uh, ether again i am i am doing it at the same thing but i still am i am still loading to avoid any kind of confusion when you are doing it on your own so we load the data and we load the spline carbon we load the raster because uh, while doing in the extraction we will kind of need the raster and we load the co uh, edge roy covariate data now inside this we will have elevation t uh, t twi and landsat b3 and b4 so we cannot access uh, we cannot see these things even though we see them here in our uh, in our this uh, environment or the variable kind of column but if you go and click on it you will not be able to see that because they are in some rast they are a raster layer so you can just check their properties uh, by running them in the script or in the command prompt and you can see that their class is raster layer so that's why we cannot see them in the in kind of a matrix format in our data frame and their dimension is 400 577 and so number of rows number of columns number of cells are so high and they, they are raster files so they have a resolution so they have an x resolution x and y resolution of 90 and 90 and the same thing uh, so this uh, pwi also has the same and landsat also has the same just the information within them will be a little bit different now you can plot it plot the elevation so you have the elevation raster data and you have plotted it it is this elevation raster data is if you uh, if you go back to the uh, we go back in the video a little bit you will see that it is nothing but the raster raster file that we have only made just uh, means it is similar to the raster file that we have made just a while ago for now we are just loading it from somewhere okay so yeah so we have plotted it now we want so to we want this uh, uh, excel uh, sorry we want this r to know that in this edge roy spline carbon that is uh, having this uh, uh, different different depths uh, and the soil depth and the easting and northing we want this excel sorry the r to know that this east and north are actually representing the coordinate so we will use this line for that and now it is able to recognize that the easting and northing are actually the representation of spatial coordinates so when now we do the plotting we will be e easily able to plot these uh, points on top of our elevation raster so let's do that and you can see we have plotted on top of our elevation raster now the question was we have to stack all the covariates that is the elevation twi and uh, the landsat and all and, but we have to stack except the twi so let's do that so just uh, we use the stack command and we can just remove the twi and stack it and we can also look at this uh, core stack so if you see here the resolution is same but the dimensions have increased by four because we have stacked four layers here okay now we can just save it previously in the class uh, sir saved it as a txt and in in here it is asked to save it as dot csv you can just change this uh, from here that uh, dot txt to dot csv because csv is nothing but comma separated so nothing else is going to change in these things so we just uh, assign it extract the values from this code vertical stacking into a data frame and write that data frame into a table named arc 
sorry edge raw uh, edge roy soil covariance so in we can go to our working directory and we'll see that we have a csv that is having the elevation uh, red k lens at b lens at b3 and lens at b4 don't see okay so that is what was for the part three now let's come to the more interesting part that is the uh, interpolation, spatial interpolation, and the Kriegi interpolation. So let me save this and uh, let's open that. Okay, so, hmm. so to do this interpolation, we needed our data to be saved in some kind of uh, the covariate data that we just saved in the CSV. We need it in some uh, other format. So, and we you know we can use the CSV data also, but it is said that we use this covariate c.txt. So, let's make that. And also in uh, in this uh, question, it is said that we have to use the TWI uh, for doing this uh, grid, making the grid interpolation. So, we'll make a new uh, txt file with all the data. So, initially, we'll just load the it. It's it. I don't need to load that because I didn't clear my variables, but just for safety, I'm doing that. Now, the same thing that I have done in this uh, last part that is taking the data, I am going to do here again. So we just load this. You can see the spline carbon. And we can load the covariate data that is elevation, rad k and all. And then you can uh, load the raster library so that we can plot uh, or we can uh, run these commands and see some uh, raster, uh, raster class inside the command prompt. We can do that for all these things also. Then we can again uh, plot it. So previously we plotted, uh, so let's plot here the TWI as it is uh, asked. Let's see if we can plot the TWI. Let's see what we get. So yeah, we have some TWI plot. So I want to get it into a new plot. Okay, so we have a plot and then we can again, as, as I said again, so this uh, Edge Roy spline carbon has the easting and northing. Now we we just tell the R that they are the coordinate system. They are the they represent the coordinates. So when we plot it again, so when we plot it, they know where to plot those points on this uh, raster. And then we just stack it and save it. That is the standard thing. We stacked it in the co stack. Then we extracted the value from this raster stacked layer into a data frame and then we just write it uh, write the data frame into the txt format with comma separated values so let's just quickly do that yeah so we have written now comes the uh, first question that is uh, doing all the analysis on that so first let's load the data so we have just saved it here and we can go and check that so here you can see we have saved the txt format also. This is a comma separated with the header. So now let's load it. As I said again uh, previously a while back that uh, we don't need to give edge dot that if you are getting confused or you are, you are getting get scared with too many dots. It, this means nothing. You can just give anything to it and it will... Uh, Probably not create any problem if the variable is not used prior. And uh, you see here, it is not going to give any problem. But to maintain the consistency with the lecture, I'll be using the same variable that was used. So we run it. Uh, we load the data into our data frame. So we have uh, edge dot that, and we loaded our uh, stacked covariate data frame into this. Now it was asked that we want the summary for the depth 15 to 30 and 30 to 60. Now there is two ways. You can just directly get the summary from 
uh, separately of each of these things by using the summary command. So you will see the mean, median, first quartile, third quartile, min, max, and same you can do for the 3060. So, okay, so I, I didn't clarify that in this edge data, these columns are having that uh, uh, lower bound and upper bound of where the sample was collected. So, uh, so that this is a column name with the dots and all, x 30.60 centimeters. So, we are just using those to access that column. Or you can do them together also, making it a subset, making this uh, a subset of this edge data with just two columns and doing the summary for that. So if you do that, you will get them in one go. So that's one down. Now we have to check the normality of both at both depths and uh, do some kind of transformation. So we can, uh, we will do the log transformation and let's see uh, the normality and the uh, so before that, let's also check the skewness and the kurtosis of these things. So for that, we need the package FBasic. That is just the basic statistical package. We, we load it. Right. And uh, we can use the sample skew test for uh, uh, checking the skewness. So we have a skewness value and kurtosis value so i have one question so i, I don't think you will you will have any problem answering this but uh, what does this skewness tell us in a distribution okay probably it is too simple so basically skewness tells us uh, how much is this uh, variation or this distribution is uh, shifted or uh, towards the right or towards the left from the normal distribution right so if it is uh, my, more than min less than minus 1 and greater than 1 then it is considered a highly skewed distribution and if it is between minus 0 0.5 to 0 0.5 or even better if it is zero then we say it is a fairly normal distribution and uh, how about kurtosis? Okay, so kurtosis is basically if you have um, uh, around one, then that means your peak is too high. It uh, kurtosis uh, is kind of quantification of how uh, high is your uh, normal uh, is your distribution compared to the uh, sides compared to the side boundaries so it's in the common language i'm saying so that we don't get confused and don't forget it so it is basically checking how stable your uh, distribution is if you because if you remember uh, one uh, something which is wide at the bottom is going to have more stability so you can say if the kurtosis is, is positive and uh, greater than one or close to one, then it is not going to be stable because it is going to be tall and uh, uh, less wide. Whereas if it is uh, around minus one, then it is going to be uh, too stable. It is going to be almost flat. That's what the distribution will be. Whereas if you have a kurtosis of zero, then in that case, correct me if I'm wrong in saying zero. So if we have zero, or uh, somewhere around that between minus one to one, we'll have a normal fairly distributed peak. Okay, so you can get the uh, kurtosis value also. So this seems to be, I think, uh, a high peak. And uh, when we say about uh, skewness, so it is it is not that much skewed yeah the distribution is not that much skewed so let's see now let's do the normality test so for that we need to load the package nor test and let's do the normal test for both of these uh, depths so we have our p value that is very less so basically it is not a uh, normal not a very good normal distribution and the same for the second one also oh no this is running the first one yeah same for the second one the p value is very small so we we don't have a 
good normal distribution. Now let's just plot it. Let's just visualize. So we did this test. Let's just visualize what do we get. So we'll have a 4 by 4 plot. Let's say we'll make a 4 by 4 plot. So this is for 13. So yeah, we can see it is not that much skewed. It uh, according to the value, but it looks the uh, looks skewed only to us, right? Now let's do the QQ line. Let's do the same thing for our 3060 also. Yeah. So these values are so small. So I don't uh, I don't think that we can we should call this as very skewed. And also that's what the value we got. The skew test was giving us uh, value around. 0.18 right and uh, if you look at the uh, value between minus 0.5 to 0.5 this distribution is fairly symmetrical so it looks fairly symmetrical but still it is not uh, the normal log normal test oh, sorry the normal test it is saying that it is not uh, a very good normal distribution so let's take the log and uh, let's see what do we get so you just uh, do the tests again with the log so when we do that, you will see we have a less p value. So we can say now that, okay, this is a fairly, you know, normal distribution. But you will see that uh, this normal distribution didn't help much in case of uh, the 3060 depth. Because it was uh, 10 power minus 13, it uh, came to 10 power minus 7. It helped in make increasing the normality, but not that much. Now let's just visualize what uh, we are seeing here. So yeah, now you see after the log distribution, uh, taking the log, it is uh, much more representative of the normal distribution. And if you plot the line QQ norm and QQ line, you'll see the same. But it is not uh, very helpful in case of the second one. That's what we also saw from the test. So yeah, let's plot that. So that's what uh, was asked to do in the second one. So do the necessary transformation and uh, check the normality of the plot. So, and you can export this again into the PDF. <clears throat> now let's move on to the another question that is use edge Roy covariate and use TWI to create grid points. Okay. So previously we used elevation. Now we use uh, TWI. So basically what we did when we want to create a grid, we want the extreme points. Uh, the ex uh, extreme minimum and extreme maximum points. So to make that, we will use for now the TWI. So let's see. So first we load our edge, uh, edge Roy covariate. And uh, so what is it saying? Error. So maybe I need to load this library raster and let's see. Errors in eval. So let's see if there is an edge Roy covariate. If it is there, then probably this error is not very meaningful to us. Okay, so there is. Okay, let me do this ITIR again. Oh, yeah, so this happens sometimes. It works fine when you are doing it, but then some error comes. what might be the problem here so feel free to tell me if you know what is the problem and i'll just waste time figuring it out so we use this edge roy covariate maybe the spelling is the issue let's see Okay, let me just clear the variables. No, I don't want to get confused. Okay, so we oh, so we have it. So this error is probably in some other uh, no slot name SRS. So we, we'll see if this error is causing any trouble to us. But it is able to load the elevation, rad k, twi, landsat, b3 and b4. So we'll just proceed with that. Okay, so that's fine. So basically. Now what we have to do, we have to use this TWI. In that, so if we just uh, 
we want to see the TWI since it is a raster we will not be able to see that that is fine so basically what we want to check is this TWI will have some value so let's go to our uh, this thing yeah so we didn't save TWI here so let's go to our txt and let me show you that this TWI will have some values they will be somewhere here and uh, yeah, these values 22, 23, 23. Yeah, so we and some of them, uh, some places, these values will not be available. So we have to first get the columns where these values are available and then get the easting and northing for those columns to decide the extreme bounds of our grid. So we'll do that using this approach. So what we are doing basically, uh, we are creating a temporary data frame which will contain, uh, which will have the cell numbers from of, of how many cells uh, does this CW, uh, TWI has the values. So let's do that and let's look at this temp D. So the TWI has these many values. So 23,000, uh, sorry, 230,800. Now, we need to know the values of TWI at these points. So we'll run this again. And if you see, we'll have the values. As I said, at some points, we'll not have the values. So we need to remove them. To do that, we'll use this line, com temp D complete cases. And now if you see, it will be, I'm sorry. Now if you see, it will be nicely, all the NAMs are gone. And now we can get the, oh sorry, yeah. Now we can get the cell numbers where these values are not zero. So basically we are extracting the first column from this temp D and it is stored in some kind of a uh, number format rather than in a data frame format. Now we can use this cell numbers now to get the XY from our cell and convert it into a grid. So let's run this. Oh, sorry. Let's run this and let's go to the XY grid. Now you see, we have it. A, we have a grid. So as I said, so previously I tried to plot. Let me try again, whether you'll be able to successfully plot it to show you that it is like the grid. I, it is capital, right? Yeah. So, NPCH is equal to 20. And I hope it should plot. There are a lot of points, but yeah, let's see. It will be nice to see the grid plot and how the grid is looking actually. So it is showing that it has plotted. The plot is not loaded yet. Okay, for some reason that is happening. Let me try one more time and then we will not waste time in this. While that is doing something, we will go to our code. So, we have a grid. And we have points X and Y. So, okay. So, yeah, we have a grid. We have a plot. So, probably if we reduce the uh, size, point size, then we will be able to see the grid nicely. But I'll let you guys do that because I'm not very familiar with R. You would have probably noticed this by now. <laughs> that I'm not very familiar with R. Okay, so GXY. Now, we uh, we have the grid points and we have some points where we have the data also. Now, we need to do the interpolation. So, we'll, so that will be, so we have uh, made the grid using the TWI points. Now, we need to do the interpolation. So, for that, we need the GSTAT package. We load that package. And basically, here what we are doing is for our simplicity, so we have edge. Have I deleted it? Okay, so let me just read it again. 
So we have this edge dot data that is the data frame. As it read. Loading the data frame. Okay, it is taking time to load the data frame. Let it load the data frame. So basically, we have uh, this. We are just loading uh, this data frame into that. Probably, I think it is still in that uh, stuck in that plot. That's why. Let me just stop it. So I wanted to use Python, but uh, so many data frames and plotting the raster and all those things, I am not very familiar in Python. I don't know that in Python. So I was not able to shift and uh, use this Python for this. And I don't know MATLAB. I don't think MATLAB has this kind of options. So I'm stuck with R for now. And this is giving me problem. OK, so basically. Uh, we'll just I'll just uh, talk through maybe uh, when it whenever it, this is done then we can go ahead I save it I can't even save it okay so um, just one sec I don't want to wait that much Okay, good. So we'll open R again, yeah. And we can open our, ah, uh, yes. So probably I'll need to run this thing till, okay, I was using the second one. Till here. So let me run this thing till here and then let's see. So select everything and then just run. Now since we are not plotting that big data set, it should not take much time. Yeah. So we have all the plots here again. Nicely, it is coming in a big format right now. So this is good. Yeah. So I was saying, so we need the library GSAT for doing that uh, spatial interpolation. And but in this line we are doing basically is we are just changing the name of this east and north to x and y for our ease so if you just run it and go and check that so from east and north it has been changed to x and y so that's not very important line basically we are doing that to use this here so location x y we want to say we want to tell r that when we are doing this interpolation this uh, new grid has this x x and y and similarly this old grid also has x and y which is this and we so here we are doing uh, this uh, doing the interpolation for the idp of 2 and 3 so we'll just do the interpolation all the interpolation quickly and we'll plot the plots now we have plot uh, we have the interpolation results here but to see them in a nice uh, kind of uh, raster format, we need to convert them uh, from x, y, z points to raster. So if you see here for now, they are just x, y and the predicted value, right? So we need to convert them into raster. So we'll do that. And we'll just now plot. Yeah, so we have a 4 by 4 plot. So as is this said, then you uh, save the images uh, PDF or something, you can save that. You can give the title to each of these things. So basically, I have given here for 13 to 15 to 30 at IDP of 2, 50 to 30 at IDP of 3, and then 30 to 60 at 2, and 30 to 60 at 3. OK, so that's that question. Uh, now let's come to the uh, Kriging interpolation. So we have to do the Kriging, and we can try uh, Gaussian, circular, spherical, and exponential model for that. So I have just given here the model. So for now, we'll do the Gaussian. You can try the exponential, spherical, 
uh, and uh, what was the last one? So there is some called uh, model called Matt also. You can try that. I'm not. I don't know what that is. And there is exponential our old exponential standard format that was shown. So you can try that also. So the key for these models are these only. You don't have to write the whole Gaussian term. So let's run this. So we have the model. This is just a string. That is the model. Now here is uh, here is what uh, where we are fitting the variogram. So we take the log because we know with the log we have a nice uh, kind of nearly normal distributed, and we tell it where the location is. And so we have just here given the column name. So it needs to access this column name from some data frame. So here we are specifying the data frame also. And uh, then we have the model. We are making the model now. Here, here is where I am specifying the which model we are using. So for now it is Gaussian model. So we'll run it. We have saved the model. Now we'll fit the model, and we can observe. We can also see now. That's what was also asked. See the nugget. Uh, the partial sill and the range of the model. So we have this. We can uh, try different uh, kind of a model, and we can do that. So if you see now the exponential, we have used the exponential model, and there are the sill and range have changed. So we can do that comparison, or we can just plot the model also. So for now, this is the exponential model that has been plotted. So now we have done the variogram. So what was the use of the variogram? If you remember from the last session, the use of variogram is to get the weights, because in this uh, inverse distance interpolation, the weights uh, were uh, the inverse the uh, one by two, the inverse of the distance between the points between the point they, where we want and all the other points where we need the data. But in this case, in case of Krieging interpolation, the weights are the are determined from the variogram. So this is that variogram, and now we do the we do the Krieging interpolation, and this is where the interpolation uh, sorry, the interpolation data will be stored. So if you go and uh, see the Krieg interp, oh Krieg not found. Uh, Did I import Krieg? Probably I have not imported the Krieg itself. Let's see. Oh no, it is. I ran the wrong file. Okay. So using ordinary Krieging interpolation, it is doing the, uh, it is predicting the value at these points, and at the same time, it is going to give us the variation also. Variation that is possible in the uh, interpolated data. So it is taking some time to interpolate. So let okay. So it has done now. You can check the values in the Krieging interpolations. So we have the grid points, the new data, and the corresponding uh, predicted value with for that with the variation. So that is done. Now we can do. We can plot it and we can see uh, both the variation and the uh, prediction. So we have this prediction, and on the right side we have the variation. So that was the end of this uh, uh, confidence builder. Yeah. So for now we'll restrict ourselves to for this session we'll restrict ourselves to this much. So you can get familiar with it for because it for me itself it was a little overwhelming till this point. So I don't want to go. Into uh, the model fitting and uh, getting all those things because the next session probably will have some kind of model fitting, so we'll uh, club this model fitting kind of behavior into that session. So for this session, we'll discuss till here. If you have uh, some technical doubt regarding this, uh, not this index, uh, not this uh, uh, what do we say? Uh, The syntaxes, so I can probably help with that. I'll try to help with that. I am not sure <laughs> how much I'll be able to help with that. So, yeah. Uh, sir, kindly explain uh, Krieging. Uh... Krieging is yes, in what in Krieging? 
Uh, actually, uh, the terminology itself a little bit uh, vague. Can you please? Uh, so, uh, do you understand this uh, inverse distance interpolation? Yes, yes. So, in the, what do we do basically in when we know some points? So, maybe if I want to go back. See, we know uh, the values at these points. We have done some experiments and gotten the value at these, at these points. Now, we want to know the value at all these at, in a fine resolution at all the other points. So what we can do is basically we we have to do some kind of weighted average to get the value at unknown points. So in uh, as you uh, in the case of normal inverse distance interpolation, the weight is just nothing but the inverse of the distance between the unknown point and the point where the concentration is known. Whereas in case of Krieging method we uh, try to see the variability with the distance so we try to see uh, how do i say this so we uh, maybe uh, so uh, okay so we try to see that with distance oh yeah there is this how the value is varying with the distance between the points that is the variogram and using that and some technique that I am not aware of, we just get uh, we get the weights that we are going to multiply with the values and get the average. So you don't need to go into the detail of how Krieging works. If you understand the concept as to how this, uh, uh, like what is how we are getting the weights from where we are getting the weights, that should be fine for this course, I think. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay, so I was not able to 100% help with that doubt because that is out of my syllabus also. If there is some other thing, maybe I can try. I can try, yeah. Let's see. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so if there is no doubt, then maybe uh, we'll discuss the model fitting prediction RMSC and the uh, next uh, week's content in the last session.